Hello lads, ladies, gents, ladders, whoever, whatever, welcome back to another video. Today I have the walking cease and desist from Disney, the human incarnation of a Disney princess herself, Snow. How are we doing? I'm good. Wow. You have That's no idea how many intro. times I practiced that to get <laughs> before we started. Um, I, like, I always try to come up with little taglines for everyone. I felt bad because Francie, uh, I was so tired by the time we finally got to do it because time zones are a bitch. <laughs> It was like four in the morning and I'd stayed up like for 20 hours at that point, like just waiting to get to the, uh, that interview. And I felt bad because I couldn't really get to it. Um, so to start off, who are you? What do you do? Where can people find you? Okay. I am original snow underscore Z. Most people know me as the original snow. I am on Twitch. I'm on Twitter. I'm on YouTube. And um, I do streaming content creation. Lots of different things, actually. Yep. So you're one of those very multi-talented people, unlike myself, who's like, I can do one thing and that's about it uh, when it comes to my life. So you do a lot of singing, um, which is something we're definitely going to get into. You dabble in art, uh, I have seen, and obviously, yes, content creation and streaming. Um, I actually want to start with the art stuff because it's not something you necessarily promote super heavy. Um so tell me about your background in art and like the stuff you like to make. Okay. Well, um, I studied graphic design, text and image art in school. I actually went to um, a pretty big university up in Boston and um, got my degree in fine arts. And uh, I like painting a lot. A lot of what I do on stream is painting. Um, I do have a website and a lot of the time I either do giveaways or I sell the art that I do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I really enjoy art. I like telling people about art. People come in and ask questions. I love to talk about how to do things. I do, um, local shows, um, sell art there. That Those are usually my big money makers throughout the year, mm. um, is selling my art at, uh, little art fairs and getting a booth and stuff like that. Do you have a particular medium in art that you prefer, like painting, drawing, you know, uh, stuff like that? Because my ex fiance, she's an artist, and I do a lot of resin work. Around. Yeah, she she messed around with so many different things. So, like, what got you into doing resin work? Um, resin, you can really—it's very versatile. Uh, I can make uh, home decor, coasters. You can make art, uh, jewelry boxes, anything you can think of that can go into a mold. You can make with resin, but um, I fall back on acrylic painting as well a lot. Um, and I do acrylic pouring, which is uh, exactly what it sounds like. You put a lot of paint into a cup and you pour it on a canvas and yep. whatever comes out, comes out. Yep. Uh, it reminds me very much of uh, kind of how some guitars get designed when they have like similar idea to like you know how they do like imprinting on like uh like helmets and things like that for bikes uh where it's you know they have that just vat of paint and they just kind of dump it in there and what you get is what you get and every design becomes unique from it um exactly uh, that's, that's really really cool um so with your art do you have like anywhere that you wanted to take it specifically or is it just kind of like where it is now is you're very happy with it I'm okay with where it is now. Um, it's sort of evolved from when I was in school, you know, going to a fine arts institution that is associated with a museum. Uh, I had this grandiose idea that I was going to, you know, be in uh, museums all over the world and doing, you know, your stereotypical lady in a chair painting, mm -hmm. observational painting, as it were, oil painting, all that kind of stuff. And as I grew and learned, I just evolved in an, uh, it, it might be considered a little bit more of a crafty type of art mm. um but it's something i enjoy doing and it's where i am right now and that's fine i think there's nothing wrong with it being more crafty especially you know if you want to essentially be able to you know turn that hobby into a business because uh, as someone who is you know used to be a music tutor until COVID hit um you know having you know the ability to make something happen financially from a hobby is you know it's very liberating and it, it doesn't make work feel like work compared to you know your regular nine to fives and things like that um now you as i've mentioned uh, a very good singer 
especially compared to a lot of the plebs that like to join back in the day for the karaoke streams and things like that, in which you still run a karaoke stream uh, with Kiki, who is changing in the middle of changing all of her stuff. So I've got to get used to the new name and everything, but she will be on here hopefully soon. Um, but talk me through your history with singing. Uh, there's not a lot outside of streaming, actually. Mm. I, it, it was more of a hobby. I've never learned. I've never studied. I've never done anything professionally with singing. I just like to do it. Uh, I first found Twitch Sings in 2020, and it became my everything. Mm. And unfortunately, that is, is as quickly as it came into my life, it was gone. But, um... I had a lot of success with it. Um, I don't like to think of myself as a singer. I, like I said, I just do it for fun. Mm. Uh, but I met a lot of people through Twitch Sings, and um, my channel grew uh, through those relationships. And I think that's a it's a really good thing when you grow that way um, versus just random people coming in. Mm. Um, building relationships and building communities, I think, is an, an important thing on Twitch. And um, Twitch Sings was was different. It allowed us to uh, jump in a party and grow and meet people and do things together. And um, it's unfortunate that it's gone because of the legality of the music. But mm. I understand why it's gone, but still wish it was back. Look, Amazon has all the money in the world. They should never have got rid of it. Like, they have Amazon Music. They could have done something with licensing. Even if they were like, okay, if you want to do Twitch things, pay five bucks a month to be able to access it, to stream it or whatever. I'm sure they would have made their money, no worries. They could have run ads. People would have been okay with it. Uh, it is sad to see it go. Now, when it came, when it comes to singing, do you find, because for me personally, right, like guitar is something I do very much as a way to deal with anxiety, depression, you know, as really just an outlet for a lot of my emotional uh, issues uh, is a nice polite way of putting it but do you find yourself that singing is kind of like that for you as well oh totally um i mean i th I think i had that phase as any teenager growing up where you know lincoln park and evanescence are blaring and your tears were streaming down your face and you're <laughs> screaming and, and singing as loud as you can and that kind of stuff and singing has always been that sort of escape for me mm. from things um and uh, I know you've talked about mental health with uh, some of your other guests. And uh, I myself have re recently been um, given a diagnosis of depression. Mm. So it uh, makes sense that I also seek out music as a form of an outlet. Um, it also makes sense with art as well. Because yeah. a lot of a lot of artists um, <laughs> yeah. express themselves when, uh, through depressive episodes when you're happy you can't create as much unfortunately mm. yeah it's the uh bitter irony of it you have to suffer to create the best but yeah. i also think that is to an extent a load of shit because it comes down to you know any given day you could be the happiest the saddest what comes out is what comes out um you know as you said with your acrylic pouring you know it's what you get's what you get you know so it comes down to every individual um now, obviously, mental health uh, is something I do talk about a lot. Um, how do you find, obviously, you know, with the Twitch things, unfortunately, coming to an early demise, how do you find that your mental health kind of went after that? Because I know you were quite upset, along with a lot, and I mean a lot of other people, uh, given the, the time period and everything that was going on. Oh, I'm, I'm still upset. It's just... Uh, when we went into lockdown, it for a lot of us, it was the only outlet to be with other people. Um, it gave us all these connections, and it was really the only thing that held us together was the singing of the music together. Um, music speaks to people. It's, you know, even if you don't know the language necessarily of each other, uh, I, there were people in all different countries that I was able to sing with because we all know the songs, right? It didn't matter. Um, and I, once that was gone, you know, you're back to being an introvert and not having people around and not quite dealing with the world the way that it is, because the world, the way that it is right now is really difficult to deal with. Mm. 
Um, um, so. and, and speaking of like how difficult the world is to deal with, uh, you were running an incredible series uh, that I think was one of the best series. The only problem was your internet connection loved to shit out on you halfway through every time where you were talking about uh, awful things happening within uh, small communities, especially within you know, African-American communities and people of colors communities in America. And you're running a series on, you know, young girls going missing and things like that. Uh, Cause you got kind of like fallen into true crime and things like that. And like, for those who don't, if you get a chance to see that series for the love of God, watch it. Cause you know, it's one of those things we're very ignorant to regardless of it being a race thing, right? Like, just as a general, like, hey, people in our community, these are the things that are happening. We don't know about it until it's too late. Um, but what inspired you really to kind of go into talking about that sort of stuff? I am um, big fan of true crime. Mm. And it's becoming more and more prevalent that people are getting into true crime. I don't know what it is. Maybe just the fact that the world is so messed up. Yeah. We're all, you know, interested in it. It's It's kind of... Um, sad that it's it's just like watching a movie. It's not mm. not as real anymore to us. Um, and it bothered me that it's it's not real because you see people watch like the Netflix documentary with Chris Watts. Uh, he uh, is notorious now for murdering his wife and two children, mm. and being on the news every day, being like, "Oh, bring my kids home," and it was him the whole time. And uh, we have this sick fascination, I think, with these serial killers. And we all know their names, like I just said, Chris Watts. But mm. do we know Shanann's name or his kids' names or anything like that? Mm. And it bothered me that we do that. Um, and the more that I looked at the, the victims, the more I found um, an alarmingly large number of people who are missing in my country, the United States, are African American or people mm. of color. And um, mostly female and being someone of that group, uh, it became of a big concern to me. Um, how many people really go missing? And, and most of the time, it's from flub-ups from the police. It's, mm. it's, it's a little bit crazy in, in cases where um, it should be black and white. This person is missing. Let's go get them and find them. Mm. It, it, it mostly turns into... This person didn't live a life that, you know, is the girl next door. Um, so we're not as interested in finding them because of who they were, who they hung out with, what they did. If they touched a drug once in their life, I don't, you know, mm. probably the drugs got them. If they were young enough, they, they probably just ran away from home. You know, mm. don't report them yet. And, and it's sad that they, didn't, they don't put as much effort in. Um, to finding people just because of the their background or the color of their skin. Mm. Um, and it's at ridiculous numbers, and those numbers grow every day. Mm. So um, I, d I just wanted to bring light to that, and mm. I thought Morbid Mystery Mondays yeah. sounded like a good opportunity to cover those cases. Everyone loves alliteration. <laughs> um, yes. So I, like, fantastic series, as I said. I highly recommend anyone out there, if you get a chance to watch the Snow series on it, go for it um now you've talked about uh you know being a part of that kind of group now the unfortunate thing in the online space is a lot of people who are people of color and i've had pretty much everyone i can so far uh talk to this where you will inevitably receive hate uh you'll get hate raids you'll get little comments, little snide remarks, things like that. Sometimes you'll get things that might necessarily, not necessarily have been like intended to cause harm, but, you know, a little bit of a backhanded or a little bit of ignorance. And, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say I am, you know, not guilty of, you know, being ignorant to a problem because I am a white person in Australia. I have no idea what the struggles are like in America, you know. Um but what's been your experience kind of with that and how do you kind of go about dealing with a lot of that? Um, it's interesting for me. Uh, I am of mixed race. And a lot of the time when you are a person of mixed race, um, people can't nail you down. Mm. Um, you are not associated more with one than the other. 
and you're kind of um, excluded from both groups a little bit. Mm. So um, it's it's not to make light of the situation um, because uh, people of color, um, like you said, hate raids and all of these things. It's it's very prevalent right now. It's very bad. Um, but the the people like me um, get it a little bit from both sides mm. um, because you're not quite like us and you're not quite like us. Mm. So there's there's this trying to find your own place amongst both sides where you don't step on any toes either way. You're not offending anyone either way. And mm. you just need to find yourself. And that's very difficult mm. for a lot of people to do, um, especially... Uh, someone who's unsure of themselves or somebody who um, just as a person doesn't know who they are, mm. you know, take take race on top of that and it makes it even more difficult. What I have experienced more than anything is just being female on the internet. Mm. Um, you know, very, very easy for something to switch into hate speech just based on gender mm. more so than my race. Um you know, if someone doesn't like what I said in a stream, here come the DMs of, you bitch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, just a string of, you know what, you know, mm. suck my, you know what, or whatever they want to say to you. And it's like, there's no reason for it. It's just, it's a gender-based hate thing. Mm. And um, I, d I don't know, it's, it's, I don't want to take up too much time just on no, no, go for it, being please. female on the internet. It's, I think it's, it's very important to get that perspective, right? Like everyone I've interviewed up to this point has been male. And yes, we've got different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different stories. But, you know, like it, it's one thing where I feel if you try to speak about it as a woman, at least from my perspective, you get shut down being, oh, you're just being, you know, hysterical, you're making it up. And again, this is something I'm not afraid to admit I've been guilty of like, okay, I think it's getting blown out of proportion, but I'm not on the receiving end. So I don't know what it's like. So, you know, I learned, okay, maybe I should just shut the fuck up. And, you know, uh, I know people aren't Dave Chappelle's biggest fan, but, you know, he made the point of, you know, either you can complain or you can shut the fuck up and listen. And if you listen, then all of a sudden, hey, maybe I know what's going on. And... I, I've always kind of gone, hey, I actually really like that idea, like, learn to just shut up and listen, um, which is part of the reason why I wanted to do this series in general. Um, so feel free to, like, just go as long as you want talking about, you know, the bullshit, how you deal with it and stuff like that. Um, but one thing I want to add as well is how do you find that your community's helped you deal with those sort of things? Well, I mean... Uh... Again, female on the internet, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm. Um, I've had experiences where, you know, for, for me, you can tell by my state of dress that I'm, I'm not the typical what people would call e-girls or whatever. Yeah. And me personally, I don't see a problem if you have assets and you want to use them on the internet. Yeah, I mean, look it's at Snap. It's the people that choose to Snap's engage in bitch. that. <laughs> <laughs> It's the people that that choose to engage in that, that that's what they want to do, then fine. You can't complain about it. That wasn't your audience anyway. If you mm. don't have them, then what are you complaining that someone who does is using them? Mm. But anyway, um, even being someone that doesn't partake in that, you still get accused of such. Yeah. So uh, my community has helped me in terms of when they see something like that happen, they go after them, so to yeah. speak, and they're like, this is not okay. Um, I, re I remember very vividly when I first started, to course, I've been on Twitch probably eight or nine years now, mm. streaming off and on. And in my early days, I was very, very uncomfortable. Of course, I'm not the most confident person now, but um, just starting out, you know, you everything people say, you take to heart. And I was doing art streams. And I had my camera set up in a way that you could see my art, obviously. Mm. What's the point if you can't see the art? And yeah. my pen rolled, and I leaned over to get the pen. And, of course, the, the camera is facing a view that it's Isn't. not my fault if something yeah. happens to be. And I got attacked in chat. The person gets banned, and they took it to Twitter. And, like, just this woman is 
you know, using her whatever to try to get views and mm. just the most hateful speech. I, I, I ended up like crying on stream <laughs> mm. and uh, being like, sorry, guys, got to go. I'm not staying, you know. And it's just ridiculous that uh, I leaned for a thing that rolled away and it mm. turned into like this this woman will do anything for views. Mm. And that's how simple it can be to get some hate. But I, I had someone like uh, Kiki at the mm. time as a mod who could uh, go to Twitter war for me. <laughs> Kiki and, always and, down the fight. <laughs> yes. And... um. Uh, I'm very grateful to have the community that I do of people who know that that's not something that I'm interested in or, mm. you know, take part in and will call it out when they see someone mm. trying to smear your name and stuff like that. Mm. It's just unfortunate. It's stupid. You know, if you're if you're wanting to build your community, then do it. Focus mm. on your stream. Don't look at anybody else's because that's what people are doing. Well, look at her. She's getting all these views and she's getting all these subs and she's in a bikini. So mm. do something that's worthwhile and get them yourself. Like, yeah. go for it. I mean, if you got a problem with it, you throw on that bikini yourself and fucking shut up yeah. and see how it goes. I mean, uh, I've seen that on the page with men yeah. in the hot tub in the bikini and they're getting it too. So yeah. like, go for it. Yeah. And like, people will appreciate the joke. There's only the only streamers that just so happen to be female that I've ever disliked are the ones that will deliberately break the rules. And I mean, deliberately break yes. the rules and then cry foul when they get, you know, punished for doing so. But I also hate the male streamers that do the same shit. It's not like this is a big misconception when it comes to Twitch. And, uh, you know, as you said, oh, you know, picked up my pen. One guy fucking flips out like, oh, clearly you're trying to break the rules in order to get an unfair advantage. It's like, look, everyone who starts streaming, when you start streaming as a dude, you're going to get jealous that, oh, women have an easier time getting views. Guess what? Women are pretty. Men, we look like thumbs. Get over it. You know what, what happens? The women that are literally, like in real life, the women who are completely superficial, only care about the look, aren't going to maintain a healthy, wonderful community because they are based on one thing. Same thing with the dudes, the guys who are, you know, the pretty boys and things like that. Same deal. Like if they are just all about looks and there's no personality, you know, there's no community or sense of coming together, you're not going to last. Right, you look at all the big streamers that have stuck around. There's only a handful of those toxic ones that make it, really. Right, like uh, just to call her out because I always complain about her, Amaranth, who is like legitimately the only streamer that I'm like, oh god, I just can't stand <laughs> her, you know. And the only reason I hate her isn't because she's a woman. It's because you know she did the whole filming in a gym when she wasn't meant to, flashing her vag on stream multiple times, and then complaining about getting banned for it. It's like. Look, I can understand one or two mishaps. It happens. My butt cracks, you know, managed to pop out on time, from time to time back in the day. <laughs> Shit happens, right? But, like, you know, you don't cry foul when, you know, you're clearly doing the wrong thing. Um, but one thing, as you said, you know, like you had, like, Kiki come in and help, and, you know, you had that community. And as you said, you know, you're having that diagnosis finally of, you know, knowing that, hey, you know, I'm not okay, but now I understand this is why um do you find that you know through all the trials and tribulations and you know things you've had to go through um while suffering from depression having this community has made you come out the other side in a much better position or do you feel that okay i think i would have been about the same i definitely think i'm um, better off with my community because um i mean they're just like friends mm. uh when you have a that those dark moments when you're not feeling great you can call on somebody and they'll sit in discord with you and you know wait with you until you come out the other side mm -hmm. and um if you're alone with the thoughts that's a di whole different story because mm. it's your own brain telling you the thoughts and you need to get away from it at least that's what i feel like mm. and um friends are always going to be the thing that help you um break out of that that um mindset and um i bring you back to where you need to be and focus um so other things i wanted to get into since we've talked about some heavy topics let's uh, switch it up just for now um 
Kind of. Uh, it'll still be a little bit of a heavier topic. Now, we mentioned how you were writing that series about, you know, talking about the victims of, you know, horrendous crimes and, you know, really trying to empower those, uh, you know, that basically have everything taken away from them. Um, are there any other charities? Because I can see the uh, St. Jude sticker behind you on your chair. Um, are there any other charities and or causes that you've been kind of trying to throw your weight behind? Um, the Black and Missing Foundation. Um, they is two ladies that basically the same as, as myself see what's going on and wanted to make a change. They actually made a documentary. It's on HBO. If anybody has that, um, you can watch the Black and Missing Foundation. We did a charity event. We haven't raised the full amount yet. It's still open, though. It's on Tiltify. You can get it on my um, Twitter. It's pinned at the top, and it is on my channel in the About Me. Um, we're going for $2,000 to help them, and I think we're at 600 mm. um, But they work tirelessly to um, bring people um, and uh, media coverage for um, the families who are trying to find their loved ones. They work as, like, uh, mediaries between um, the police and these families for cold cases. And, and basically, when the cops are like, oh, that was a year ago, that was two years ago, whatever. They're like, mm. no, no, what are you doing? What are you doing? And keep it at the front of their minds, and they, mm. will not, they will not rest until that person is found. So it's a really, really, really great cause. Of course, we do St. Saint, uh, Saint Jude. We also have done, in my want to do something when we lost Twitch Sings, I looked up charities having to do with music, and um, there's the Children's Music Fund. We 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 did a charity for them right after Twitch Sings was over because it's like I want to do something for music because <laughs> music is gone. <laughs> I was so sad. Uh, we raised a thousand dollars for the Children's Music Fund, and I think in total, in this last two two or three ish years, we've done something like almost four thousand dollars in charity mm. events. Um, for these various charities, and uh, that's very important to me. More so than hype trains or any of that other bitty stuff, is to do something good with the community that you have. The charities are very important to me. Hmm. Do you find that running these charity streams has helped build more of a cohesive community? I, I feel like we all have a, a similar sense of wanting to do something good. Mm. I feel like that's the community that I strived for, and those are the types of people that um, gravitated to my stream, and I gravitated to theirs, mm. and uh, that's the community that we've built with each other as people that want to use what they have to do good. Mm. Um, now, we've mentioned, obviously, the death of Twitch Sings and how it was a big part of your channel. Obviously, Twitch being a gaming platform, you have streamed other games in the past, Ironically, as someone who is, as we have said, very much a Disney princess, very sweet, like very much a sweetheart, very softly spoken, you play a crap load of horror games. Uh, what's the deal with that? I love horror games. I don't spook easily. Mm. I don't know why. It's just, um, but I like uh, the tension. And uh, I just have always been a fan. When I started, like I said, like eight or nine years ago, Horror games are where I started. Um, indie horror is my big thing. I, I, As much as we all love the big developers and the big game drops and all this kind of stuff, indie horror is where I've always kind of stayed, and it's my bread and butter. Um, uh, the first game that impacted me the most, I would have to say, was Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Mm. It was unlike anything I'd experienced before. Um, because it was a horror game that took away your power. And, and most people today would probably associate that with Outlast or something like that. Yeah. But you had no gun. You had no ability to fight. Because to me, that immediately takes everything away. Like, if I have power to kill the demon chasing mm. me, then what's the point? I want to be scared. I want to yeah. have nothing that I can do except run and hide. Mm. Um, so, obviously, Amnesia was a monstrously large game for those who are a little bit younger. What, it would have been 2010? 2009, Probably. If not even earlier. I'm trying to remember roughly. 
but basically uh, that game launched a lot of careers of the biggest YouTubers that you will mm. ever see. Um, PewDiePie, Markiplier, yeah. Jacksepticeye, yeah. all of them. All of them. All of them started with that game. Um, I have never finished it. I have got like 90% of the way through because I was wow. playing it with my, at the time, girlfriend. Um, we are both playing. We used to sit on our phones because this was before Discord was really a thing. Uh, she had a shitty laptop that could just play it. And we were, like, I was playing on my computer. She was playing on her laptop. And we just sat there on the phone after school, like, called each other. And we're just talking to each other as we played through it. Because, you know, the game's single player. You can't exactly, you know, multiplayer yeah. the shit out of it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a fantastic game. Do you have any other favorite, like, horror games specifically? Or is it kind of, as you said, you know, like, just any and all indie horror games are sort of the go-to? Um... You know, a classic that has to be said, I think, is Left for Dead and Left for Dead 2. Um, big, huge following, and it always has. The game has long since been dead, but the community is still thriving and alive. Mm. And uh, the creators of that actually made Back for Blood. I don't mm. know if you've heard of that game, but um, uh, not quite as popular, but I still like to play it. And my 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 big one I turn to right now is Phasmophobia. Mm. Love the developers of Phasmophobia. They listen to their community. They have a boom in Discord. Mm. They are always making changes. They are always making updates, and they're always amazing. Mm. Um, so again, for those who don't know, uh, Phasmophobia is a very community driven game, uh, and has basically limitless potential when it comes down to it. It's a multiplayer focused horror game uh definitely worth checking out now we've talked a bit about horror what are some of the other games you have played that have kind of stuck with you over the years uh well i started gaming on the original consoles that everyone else did um i think the year i was born uh the original nes came out mm. and my family got it so like as i was growing and learning my one two threes abcs i had like a nintendo sesame street game yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i played with grover telling me how to count and stuff so i've mm. always and um i used to have um a pc right when it was a uh, dos you know, mm. and you had the floppy disks with the games on it with Pong. Yep. And um, my favorite at the time, I can't remember what it was called, but it was this silly game where uh, someone was throwing babies out of a burning building and you were the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> and you, had a, uh, you had to bounce the babies on a sheet and get them in the ambulance. <laughs> As morbid as that sounds, I guess that's the beginning of my horror game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to picture like this shitty DOS game, just babies getting yeeted. <laughs> yep. You, uh, the arrow keys were the only things you pressed back and forth and you bounced the child. It was it was great fun. Um, but on the, I think it was the Super NES, my favorite, favorite, favorite game has always been Illusion, Illusions of Gaia. Hmm. Now, I don't know if you know that. It's a... Um, RPG, mm. a Japanese RPG, and um, I think it started in Australia, actually. Yeah, I think it's here. It's called Illusions of Mana, and I actually own the um, the SNES cartridge. I found it for like thirty bucks. I'm like, fuck yes, uh, <laughs> like years ago when I started retro collecting, and I still. It's one of those ones I've been meaning to actually sit down and finish, but. Incredible! It has mm. always been one of like the my top favorite all time games. Um, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what an RPG was. Mm. I didn't. Know, I just knew game play. Love it. And yeah. I played it over and over and over again, obsessively. Mm. And um, just I think it was last year. Uh, Snap uh, showed me how to get an emulator, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I went back to it and played it again. And I, I still love it. Mm. Um, now you mentioned that it's uh, you know pretty much your all time favorite. Um, what else would be in your favorite games of all time? So give me your top five, and if you can't think of a top five specifically, but you've got you know you got maybe like a top seven or eight that come to mind, you're allowed to give some honorable mentions. It doesn't necessarily have to be in order. Okay, um, Illusion of Gaia, obviously, Phasmophobia, 
amnesia. We've went over these, but yeah. they they're they're the, my beginnings. Um Super Mario Brothers and The Evil Within, um big one for me. Um Evil Within was was another one that impacted me greatly. Um I just really enjoy that game a lot. Mm. It's a game I really need to sit down and play. Every time I've tried, the game crashes at like one specific point, like half an hour in, and I just get mad and just never play it again. And then mm. I'll try again a year later, like, damn it, I want to try it, because I know it's a good game. I've seen it played uh, many a time. Um, now, I'm going to hazard a guess as to what the answer is going to be for this question, but this is one of my, my favorite questions to ask. Go back to a time before you were 16, so you're up to the age of 16 and before, you can pick any game from that time period. What would you reboot to play right now? Have it in modern graphics. You know, you could have it the same if you want. Gameplay the same or more modern controls. What game would you love to see just playable right now for you? From your childhood. Tough one. Um, you know, uh, I would probably say one of the, any one of the Silent Hill games, mm. um, it'll never happen, but, um, <laughs> yeah, cause it could <laughs> in, in modern graphics would be, you know, looking at what they did with Resident Evil, mm. um, recently, they could do so much with, uh, just same story, you know, don't, don't mess it, don't, <laughs> Yeah. Well, during these things, or you you think you have an idea and change it, don't do that. Just take it and make it look cool. Mm. That's all I want. I was hoping you were going to say the baby eating game. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Could you imagine the outrage? Baby on the on the concrete. Total, hundred percent great graphics. Yeah, uh, with Four the American K. healthcare system, it'll be fine. Yeah. Don't worry about it. You only spent twenty grand to have the baby. Uh, <laughs> No refunds. Um, that's awful. Uh, sorry, I got myself with that. Um, now, <laughs> obviously, we brought up Silent Hill, Resident Evil. Um, which of those two are you picking? You can have one, one of the series or one of the other, regardless of you know uh, it being more modern playable. If you had to pick one series to keep, one series to get rid of, what would you pick? Jeez, I didn't know these questions were going to be so difficult. Yeah, I know. Do I get to count uh, PT? Yes, you can count PT, because as far as I'm concerned, even though it didn't get finished, it's still technically a Silent Hill. I would go with Silent Hill then. Because um, PT was another one of those that just changed the game for horror, you mm. know. And I wish it would have come come out and been completed you know or at mm. least leave the game so that people can still play it don't be so jaded that you're like no one can play this ever again we're taking it away stupidest mm. thing ever but yeah. um for the resident evils the newer two mm. i'm I, it's controversial but i'm not the biggest fan i don't feel they're resident evilly enough if that makes yeah. sense no, th they feel I like great horror games. Mm. Like, if I were to play that and you never said the words Resident Evil, I would have loved them more, I think. Mm. As soon as you're like, this is a Resident Evil game, I'm like, it's no, not it's what not. You expect. No, it's not. <laughs> mm. um, a guy I watch a lot, and I brought him up, um, who does really, really good deep dives into horror games and, like, just old-school PS1 era, PS2 era games uh, called Avalanche Reviews, he did... Uh, an entire retrospective on the entire Resident Evil series. So he went through every single game one by one. He put it all together. It's like a freaking five and a half hour video. It's like this giant freaking project that he did. And he said something that I agree with, and I think you would as well, in saying, like, by the time you get to four, as good as four is as a game, that's where Resident Evil stopped being Resident Evil because it went from being this, you know, survival horror, things are difficult to all of a sudden it's like, yeah, 4 does have its difficult moments by all means. It's more horror elements rather than a horror game specifically because you are so empowered as a player. Whereas I feel like there's a reason for that. Hmm. Because at the time, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I feel like I remember at the time that 4 was coming out, the Wii came out mm. and they made 
four playable on the Wii. Yep. Who used the Wii, <laughs> but the general public? You yeah. know, it wasn't like the gamer console. Mm. Um, gamer consoles has always been Xbox, PlayStation, those things, you know, mm. serious serious gamers they're not serious gaming on the wii you know um there's, they, there's gonna I, be someone out there like, like shut the fuck up the wii's the best <laughs> i'm gonna get more you stupid bitch <laughs> <laughs> you don't know anything about gaming how dare you <laughs> go back to disney um <laughs> uh i feel like the wii changed some things because people wanted to include everybody mm. and how games were played and once you start thinking about everybody you start dumbing down some mm. stuff granted uh i don't think they ever really dumbed down how bad the voice acting and lines have been um it, like e even like with eight and i've played a shitload of eight because i got village when it came out um everyone's like oh the voice acting is great i'm like really ethan's voice is just like he's got nothing there's no lines that like you go back and it's like, okay, as awful as, even like Silent Hill as well is very guilty of this. But you yes. have these like just really god awful voice lines, terrible writing in terms of dialogue. But it made them endearing. Whereas you look at like a lot of modern horror, it's like, you know, as good as something like Alien Isolation is, as good as like Evil Within is, what makes them good? Well, as an actual game, they're way more competent than what we used to have. But. Mm. They don't really have that endearing quality of like, even though, yes, this is a big studio, you know, you go back, play original Silent Hill, you go back, play, especially like Resi 1, like on PS1 and just how bad that shit is. Um, and I sent the video to Snap and he said he sent it to you that uh, yeah. ring for <laughs> Dreamcast. Um, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Was it a murder? Oh my God. <laughs> it fucking gets me every time. <laughs> that shit, like, even though, yes, these are technically done by big studios, it makes it feel like, dude, I could have made that. <laughs> like, you know, it, 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 it makes it a lot more personal uh, in comparison. Now, uh, we've already given a couple, I would say, slightly controversial gaming opinions. Um, typically, I ask this one towards the end, but it kind of flowed into it pretty easily. Give me your most controversial gaming opinion. Hmm. I don't know if it's... It is. It's kind of in the same vein as what we were just talking about. Hmm. I don't like to play games in English. <gasps> if possible. I am subbed over dubbed. That's with <laughs> anime, games, anything. <laughs> because... I cannot, I am the, I don't know what it is about my ears, but I have the distinct ability to recognize voices and know, mm. like, I hear them and I'm like, that person's from that. Mm. Um, and I hate it when it's the same five people yeah. in something. <laughs> if I hear the guy that played Spike in Cowboy Bebop one more time in an <laughs> anime, I will lose my mind. You can hire someone else. There's it just... I've heard him in a Slurpee commercial for 7-Eleven before <laughs> on the radio in the car, and I almost lost my mind. <laughs> like, hire someone else. There's a billion and one people who want to be voice actors. Why are you hiring the same five people to do everything? Look, <laughs> I hate it. We love Sorry. Troy Baker, but, like, yeah, dude's in, like, everything <laughs> ever. Um, stop. Now, you mentioned anime, and uh, oddly enough, as much as we hate stigmas and things like that, which I talked about with Francie, Ironically, gaming and anime do tend to, especially if you like RPGs to some extent, do tend to go a little bit hand in hand. Now, you have been uh, very vocal on Twitter about uh, talking about, I think it's Fruit Baskets, if I recall correctly. Uh, one that I don't know jack shit about, uh, personally, but I am someone who's been getting a lot into manga, and I've said in previous ones, I'm not ashamed to say I love romance manga and stuff like that, because, you know, sometimes... Helps you, you know, get those bad feelings out. You know, helps you deal with that loneliness and things like that. And you can impart yourself on those characters. What are some of your favorite animes, favorite mangas? Obviously, I mentioned Fruit Baskets. Um, yeah. But tell me, like, what got you hooked on that as well? Um, obviously, the two everyone knows, Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z. Mm. 
running home after school, trying to catch it, you know, trying to see if they have freaking moved on in the Goku Frieza fight past the same <laughs> five episodes that they kept replaying. Like, I just want to see what happens. Stop. The, they're screaming for eight episodes long. You know? <laughs> I want to see how it ends. Um, but those two started everything for me. Um, I became a comic book junkie, um, high school, college age. Once I moved into like dorms and apartments at college age, I was staying at the comic book store. I was sitting mm. down on the ground, like reading, and they were like, "Are you gonna leave? Are you gonna buy something?" <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, I, I just want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a collection, but um, yeah. In, in terms of anime, Naruto was always a big one for me. Uh, Inuyasha. Um, uh, Full Metal Alchemist, and of course Brotherhood. After was even better because it was more closer to the manga. Uh, Kenshin. I mean, I, I could go on and on and on and on. Mm. Um. So when it comes to stories, obviously, you know, manga anime has a lot of varied stories, and I spoke about this with France as well. Um, have you got like a specific genre that just always hooks you in or are you kind of like a, just, you know, it just like whatever gets you, gets you. It tends to be either a story about an underdog mm. or a story about one person who's kind of the glue to everyone. Like if you take that main character out of the situation, there's no way that group of people would be friends or yeah. do whatever it is that they're doing but because that singular person is there so is everybody else it's like yeah. you could say that with dragon ball like because goku is there piccolo and vegeta can stand standing next to each other for yeah. five minutes you know <laughs> <laughs> um would you say you kind of feel like that you kind of relate to that in a sense like especially if you take into consideration like you know with twitch you know, you've got your community that's grown around you. And obviously, you know, there's smaller circles within that where it's like, okay, there's some cross-pollination here with these individuals and these individuals. Um, but do you feel like, hey, if I wasn't necessarily here doing this, you know, I don't feel this community could have come together the same way that it has? I would hope I would be emulating that because... Mm. I personally, now this is getting into like deep territory, I guess, a quote, deep. Um, but I feel like there is a purpose. Everybody's got a purpose. And your purpose is not like most people, I'm here for a certain time, I'm going to do what I want, and I'm going to feel good, and that's the mm. end. If that is the only reason we're here, that's pretty dumb to me. Like, just make yourself feel good, and then that's it. Like, why, why bother? Yeah. Why would the universe bother with us being here? I feel like there is a reason we're here, and it is to do good things while we're here. Support each other, be good with each other, help each other, give what you have to other people. And that's like something that I believe wholeheartedly. And a lot of those characters that I watch are that kind of way where they'll give up, you know, their last breath if they have to, to support the people around them and do good for the people around them. It's very important to me i feel like to do and that's again why we do so many charities in my community mm. and stuff do good that's all you have to do while you're here is mm. do good things um i i think honestly it, like if you weren't there it's like okay would i be as good of friends with snap you know um as we've joked in the past me and him are very much the same person just living at different ends of the country um same sense of humor love the same things um now Snap is someone who is very competitive, and mm -hmm. you are not the well, most... just because he's the best at Tetris, I mean... Second best. <laughs> <laughs> best. Suck it, son. I'll beat you every time. <laughs> <laughs> Power Rangers who? Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, speaking of Power Rangers, this is a quick tangent. Um, you, I remember when we played that, and you're like, come in and help. And I came in and, you know, I had to learn the controls. I think he won the first game. And then after that, I was like, oh, that's how this fighting game plays. It plays like this specific one. Uh, and, you know, I started beating him. You were like, oh, you're letting me win when you would beat me. No, I had no idea how to, I can't beat button mashes. So you just whooped the shit out of me every <laughs> fucking time. And me, well, I don't know if it was in the one with me and Snap, but we were talking about it after. 
The funny thing about that situation is I was smashed. I was completely <laughs> so I was just pressing buttons. And I think there was this weird glitch where there was like a purple square that was yeah. flying out for no reason. I just so, kept doing that. Certain <laughs> textures weren't loading. Um, it was a bug with the game. Because I remember looking into it. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Why isn't this working properly? Purple um, square, purple square, purple square. <laughs> I remember yelling that. Um... But yeah, like dealing with someone like Snap, who is you know tends to be hyper competitive, just to shout him out again. Um, how do you feel that you know that impacts how you go about things? Are you willing to meet that challenge and kind of bump heads a little bit with him when it comes to playing a game, or are you more like, okay, look, we'll we'll let him have his you know his little bit of a moment, you know, puff his chest a little bit, um, <laughs> and then humble him a bit later. Gotta get me or, in trouble. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um. No, uh, we're. I think we're both competitive. We played. Um, what's that game called? Shoot, it takes two, mm. and they have like little mini games where you go head to head. And it, d he just kicked my butt. I mean, it's just I can't even. Yeah. I can't even deny it. He's he's. I will say, he's gonna be mad. <laughs> <laughs> the first time we played Brawlhalla together, mm. I just whooped the floor with him and he was it started out like oh let's play and it was that kind of thing where you're like laid back in your chair and pressing the buttons and you know that he's he's into it further when he goes yeah and there's that sit up <laughs> <laughs> that sit up like wait a minute <laughs> yeah because uh me and i'm gonna glint, get in so much trouble why are you doing this uh, well me and glint gave him shit uh during the house as well i've got to i've got to give the boys some shit you know like um, there are the, like part, part of the reason of doing this series, as I've mentioned many a times, is to be able to connect more with my friends online. Because, you know, how often have we really hung out in the years of knowing each other? Less than five, easily, right? Um, and to be able to sit there and go, okay, well, I want this series as a whole to be like, okay, you know, this is to show like how important it is to build a community. And like, even if you're not super active, how good your friendships can be. Because, like, you know, time zones, how often, you know, do I get to catch you stream? Maybe once a month, you know, at best. You know, it's like Outlaw Man, uh, who I just interviewed last night at the time of recording, but, you know, it'll be, be like two, three days uh, between the episodes. Uh, like, you know, his stream is at, like, one, two in the morning, and I only get to catch it if I've got to work, you know, or if I've got the day off and I just so happen to be up. Um, so... The reason why I want to give Snap some shit is because, you know, he also has a very stupid sleep schedule himself and tends to only stream very, very late. So I don't get to catch him. So uh, it's our way of bonding uh, in a way, you know, give each other a little bit of a, a little bit of shit. Um, but he has shared his side of the story and I want to get your side of the story of how you two came to be because... I always joke whenever you two are around each other that I have diabetes because of how sweet you two are. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite things, you know, I, like, I think we're all guilty of living a little vicariously through friends and, you know, them being happy in relationships and things like that. And, you know, seeing how well you two work together, you know, it, 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 it makes me happy knowing that, you know, two of my friends, even though, yes, there's this huge distance physically uh, you know, due to the fact you know the planet's fucking huge, um, be able to still make it work. But I want to hear your your side of the story on how you guys came to be. It's pretty much like you said. Um, Glint was doing Twitch things. Um, I mm. uh, if people don't know, I mod in uh, Glint's channel. Um. And uh, I was listening. I wasn't at the point yet where I had a PC that could do Twitch things. Mm. So I was living vicariously through these people yeah. <laughs> listening. And oh, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do this. Um, but he joined. And um, it didn't share the, the camera. Yeah. It had, uh, if you didn't know Twitch things, like it, it would show this little like avatar on a stage dancing and stuff. Yeah. Think of like old rock band or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, what is, who is that? <laughs> who is that? I need to know who that is. And I went to the channel and I just I obsessively was in stream chat from that point on bothering. <laughs> <laughs> um, private messaging, all that stuff. Like it just, the voice, it was the voice. So what you're telling me is you slid into his DMs. 
Exactly. Yep. My Another brag. Hey, yeah. Look, that's Giga Chad move, right? Like, <laughs> you're like, that's just, my boy now. Tough shit. Just use, the, use the voice. That's all <laughs> yeah. you got to do. Whereas They'll me, I, I sound like a droning rat, which is why I don't sing. That's why I play guitar. Um, you got the guitar. Now, speaking, just to go back on singing, I mentioned earlier you uh, run kind of like this karaoke, I think it's like Talent Tuesday or something with uh, Kiki. Again, Kiki has changed uh, very recently. I think it's like Kawaii or something. I forget. Mm-hmm. Um, but tell, like, talk me through, like, what, obviously we kind of get the idea of what inspired it, but like, I want to hear it come from you like what inspired you know let's start our own karaoke stream let's you know host a community based style thing and like what are some of the challenges that come along with trying to make that happen so after twitch things um i continued to do my own little pity party streams where (laughs) like people can show up that they want but i'm gonna sing and you know not necessarily kosher on a twitch but I didn't care. I was going to do it because I was sad. And, you know, I wanted to sing Seether, Broken, and Cry (laughs) on stream. So I did that. And uh, she approached me and she was like, "Um, we should do, I think it was somebody's birthday. It was either mine or France because we're both in the same month, Mm. July, next month. Um, And one of us did, or both of us, I don't remember, we did on stream karaoke birthday singing. Mm. And um, she was like, we should do this. This should be a thing. I was like, I'm game if you're game. Mm. And um, it was unfortunate because she had a whole bunch of stuff happen right when we were supposed to start. She was going to be the the lead. Mm. And we would switch back and forth week to week. And it was called um, Talent Tuesdays. And, it, you know, anyone can join. There's a, there's a Discord for it. Um, but she had to be gone. And I think it was for like a whole month or more. So I did it for the first couple weeks and then passed it on when she was ready to come in. Mm. And um, I think we've had a few co-hosts. I think France has done it once or twice. Um, But basically, you can join in, uh, pull up YouTube, type in your song and karaoke, share it to the Discord. Whoever's streaming, you know, shares Mm. it and sing away. And it's the best thing ever. There's a couple of other channels that do like karaoke night singing Mm. um and it's always a good time it's 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 unfortunately we can't do duets that was the big thing with twitch sings is someone would record half and you could come in and do the other half if you want to see some of those i have them on my youtube i i saved like at least a thousand duets from twitch sings on Mm. my pc before it ended so every now and then i get the urge to be sad and i that's when you'll see like a mass of them show up on my youtube page yeah <laughs> um but it, it's unfortunate we can't do duets but we 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 have some sing sings mm. that, it makes us feel good yeah um now to kind of go to continue on with uh like singing and stuff like that recently you've been uh kind of dabbling in music a little bit more um how's that been going and what kind of got you to you know kind of go okay i'm enjoying karaoke let me kind of go a little for lack of a better term professional i guess um like more legitimate into like actual songwriting things like that what kind of got you started in doing that i just want to sing uh, it's just this feeling that i get and i want to do it and i sit there and i'm like i want to do it i want to do it i want to do it and i either do covers or um I'll go to websites where it's like um, copyright free, just mm. use it and just link back to me type stuff and it'll be the melody and I'll sing over it and write some lyrics or do something um, melodic on top of it. Mm. And I put it on SoundCloud or YouTube, one of the two. And it just, it makes me feel better. Um, mm. So it's not maybe so much as um, hoping that it becomes a big thing. It just is a, another form of release for me that I, I get this. I need to do it. I need to do it. <laughs> so thing. when it comes to writing, do you have like a specific process towards it or do you just kind of go with the gut and just see what comes out? Because like for me as a guitarist, I have two very different modes when it comes to writing. Um, I have the music theory side that is like, okay, well, I like this melody. Let me break down what key it's in, what mode you know, and then, you know, do all the math behind all that shit. 
and I've got the let's just improv it and see what sounds nice and then figure it out <laughs> from there. I mostly listen to whatever the piano or what guitar or whatever it is over and over and over mm. obsessively until I know it by heart and hum on top of it and record myself humming. Mm. Whatever that tune is that I hummed, what words fit that? Mm. What's the feel that goes with how I hummed? And that's mm. how it becomes a song. Um, have you got a song that you have created or it doesn't even necessarily have to have been released, but uh, do you have like a piece that you have done where you're like, this is the best thing by far I have ever done? Because I know I feel like every musician, whether you're big, small, whatever, has that one song where you're like, I'm not beating that. I wouldn't say so, but because I very much don't like to toot my own horn i don't like to mm. promote myself i don't like anything about look at me um i'm gonna get in trouble for doing this again but uh, my motto that i like to do is i'm still a piece of garbage yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i'm favorite from vine um absolute classic but i yeah i would never be like guys listen to this i'm great mm. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a like, like oh, this is like the greatest thing ever written. But like, is this a piece that you're specifically proud of? Like, for example, the like I consider the first song I ever fully wrote, um, which I called Lionheart, uh, which is named after two things: my favorite game at the time, which was Final Fantasy VIII, and with the lead character being Leon, who has the lion heart. My grandfather, who was named Leon, just had a heart attack. And that's what got me into playing guitar and got me inspired to start writing that song. And it started off very, very simple. And over 10 years, and I mean 10 years it took to write this song, it evolved into what it is. And even though I've written things that sound better, are more technical, are more, you know, musically better, to me, I'm like, that is the best thing I have ever written because it encapsulates everything I wanted it to at the time. Um, do you have a piece that's kind of similar in, in that kind of vein? Or is it kind of like they just are what they are at the given time sort of pieces? I don't think, I, yeah, I don't think I'm at that point yet because mm. uh, Twitch Things ended the end of 2020 mm. and it took a little bit there afterwards for me to figure out that I even wanted to do anything. Mm. So I'm very, very new and everything is sort of experiment mm. right now. Um, I did get myself a uh, piano keyboard, uh, but I don't know how to use it. <laughs> You'll figure it out. <laughs> um, so I, I practice on that sometimes, but it, I'm I, I'm impatient. Like I'm watching the tutorials and like, <laughs> da, 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 da. but I just want to learn the song. So I end up just listening to the song and trying to figure it out without <laughs> uh, reading keys or any of that business. Yeah. Uh, France, I think, had a very similar issue um, early on. He's like, oh, why can't I just do it? Um, and uh, shout out to my friend Adrian. I don't know if he'll get to watch this specifically yet. I know he will watch it because he watches everything I put up because uh, he's one of my best IRL friends. Uh, I met him through work because he was the security guard at the shopping center that I work at. Because um, I work at a supermarket, but he's like, we're inside a sh giant shopping center. Um, but he... Uh, was like, oh, I really want to learn guitar. And so I started teaching him. And he is very guilty of that as well, going like, oh, why can't I just do this? I'm like, you understand, like, people go to me like, oh, you're good at guitar. I, I never think I'm good at guitar. I think I'm okay at guitar. But I go, like, to be at my level, do you know how many years it fucking took? <laughs> like, it's not like it's just click your fingers, automatically good at it, right? Like, yeah, I'm at a stage now where it's like, okay, I wanted to learn, for example, the song Kingdom by Devin Townsend last night. And I sat down, learnt it, took an hour, got the whole song down. And I'm like, cool. If you asked me to do that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, at, like when I'd only been playing for six, seven months, like a similar situation to where you're at now, that would have taken a year, you know, to sit down. And it's not even that difficult a song overall. Like, there's some diff like some techniques that are tricky, but... You know, it's like if I go to play piano myself, I can play Mad World and that's it. <laughs> that's the one song I can play because I'm like, I practiced it so much that I've got it memorized. It is ingrained in everything in my DNA at this point. But I have, you know, no patience on piano. 
um i i spent a lot of time when i was teaching piano um like look like i could play from reading the books and things like that but they were never good songs they always sucked um but you know i always found that i was hitting that kind of wall of like why can't i just do it i can do it on guitar i can't do it here what the hell you know and yeah. i think also being a singer it's like okay well i can sing the melody why can't i just play it why can't my fingers do it um, yeah because you don't realize how how much more difficult it is um but why is it not the matrix i just yeah. want to download that i can do it and do it i i as awful as it is to think that we could head that way like because it gets rid of kind of the art of learning i can't wait for it <laughs> it's gonna be well, so I'm much not- better <laughs> I think he's working on a chip that's going to go in our brains and we can just do whatever. Yeah, uh, make it so, A, I'm not in pain, and B, I'm not fat. Thanks. <laughs> that's my one request. Make me stop eating I wanna so much eat shit. I want to eat carbs. <laughs> I eat too as many, many carbs. As many carbs as I want. <laughs> I eat way too much. Um, now, obviously, music is a very uh, broad art spectrum, I guess is how I would put it. And as you mentioned, you know, with your art, you've got kind of mediums that you sort of stick to. When it comes to music specifically, have you got like a genre that is like, hey, I really would love to be able to write in that specific style or like adjacent to? Well, uh, I, as much as people say Disney with me and stuff, mm. um, I keep bringing it up. But my favorite uh, singer is... Um, Shoot, why I see your face, Evanescence, Amy Lee. Yep. I'm like, what blank in my head. Um, I love her voice. I love everything about how she sings. If I could do what she does, I would do it in a heartbeat. Mm. Um, that would be something I would love to do. Uh, but uh, what um, I end up doing on karaoke nights and people request of me is usually Disney and it's yeah. usually Celine Dion or something like that, yeah. like ballad. Why yeah. I just want to be like, Wake me up, wake me up. <laughs> uh, um, now, we've mentioned Evanescence a few times, so would it be safe to say they're among your favorite bands? Yes. Um, hey, anything Amy Lee touches, I will devour. <laughs> I love it. Look, if, if anyone needs to know, she was legitimately my first celebrity crush, and I still have a thing to, for her to this day. There is something about a woman that can sing that well that is just like, I could just sit there and never speak again and just listen. You know, Control is just... The power as well. like, And like it's just everything about it is just beautiful. Um, now, I'm going to list off some singers, uh, well, two other singers that I think you might enjoy, and I don't know if you've heard them. Um just because, you know, I haven't really got to sit down and talk music with you uh, a hell of a lot because, you know, as you said, everyone tends to request a lot of Disney, you know, power ballad sort of things. It's like, yeah, look, they're nice, but, like, you know, obviously being, you know, kind of growing up through, you know, the 90s and early 2000s, you know, sort of that's when you sort of peak in music interest kind of was in terms of what you would listen to, you know, what did we have? We had grunge, we had the emo music, we had, you know, new metal, things like that. And I, you know, being an Evanescence fan, I think you're going to be a bit, not necessarily closeted new metal fan, but I think it's kind of a genre that, uh, it's so broad, people don't give it a lot of love to. What are some of your favorite bands that you grew up listening to? Um, I would say Within Temptation. Yep. Um, that sort of like uh, opera, uh, hard, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Type, Symphonic metal. Um, <laughs> there you go. Sharon Dennell, um, who is one of the singers I wanted to mention, because absolute phenomenal voice. I think I like the contrast mm. um, of this sweet, like, beautiful sounding siren and the, just the grrr behind her. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Uh, shoot, uh, putting me on the spot. That's the of course, I liked, I, gotta, I liked I anything. I'm a journalist. I liked anything, um, as long as it was music, I kind of just enjoyed it. I, I ate it up. I liked, um, Aaliyah, uh, this is kind of funny, but uh, one of my favorite singers was Selena, if you know, um, not Selena Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> Selena Quintanilla Press. 
<laughs> she was um, a Tejano. Uh, she she changed the the face of um, that style of music forever. I think mm. uh, the only reason people don't know of her as much and she wasn't able to create more music was uh, her untimely death at a young age. Mm. Um, but she she influenced me greatly as a child. I really loved her um, Mexican American style. Mm. I think like Latin American music and just like Latin music in general. Like I'm a big fan of like flamenco guitar. There is just such a beautiful rhythm, not just including the amazing melodies, but the rhythm. Um, do you find, and I've always maintained this, that rhythm is more important than melody, or do you find that melody is more important than rhythm? Because everyone, like, you can have either side of the discussion, because I've always been a rhythm is more important, because to me, rhythm's what gets you hooked more than a melody. A melody will stick with you, but a rhythm makes you want to groove to it, and, like, your body involuntarily starts liking it, compared to a melody where it's, like, it's very more subjective. I feel like it depends on the style. Mm. When it is a rhythm that you feel, it's going to be the first thing that you get from the song. You get the head move and the tapping mm. of the foot. Like The rhythm is what draws you into the song first. But if it's a softer song, if it's something that's like orchestra or um, you know, uh, opera or something, it's going to be the melody that draws you into that song mm. and makes you think it's beautiful. Mm. So I really think, yeah, for me, it, it depends on the style of the song, uh, what's going to mm. be the thing I focus on. Now, we mentioned within Temptation, uh, Sharon Denadel, uh, who is, I think, married to the guitarist, who I consider the luckiest bastard alive. Um, she has a bunch of beautiful kids, just beautiful singer. Um, but uh, a contemporary of hers that I am also a big fan of, even though I do prefer Sharon's voice overall, I don't know if you know Simone Simmons from the band Epica. So she is someone I highly recommend. I got to see her live and it was one of the best live shows I ever saw because the warm-up band did Darude Sandstorm uh, as a <laughs> death metal cover and we had a wall of death to it and everything. It was so stupid. It was so fun. Um, but a very similar vibe to what you were saying, you know, like that very you know, pretty melodic kind of almost fairy like vocals at certain points to then this like with this super powerful punch music underneath. She's a little more operatic overall than what say uh, Within Temptation is, but um, that's a band that I got hooked on. Um, the reason why I kind of bring it up in a bit of a roundabout way is because the, they have an album, I think it's called The Essence of Everything. Um, which is my favorite album by them. And we put when I bought it, we put it on in the car, me and my best friend album were living together. And it would like the cause the C D player would give you the title of the track. But it only give you so many letters. And every anytime I hear anyone talk hey, about what are those? <laughs> so old. Yeah, I know. Wait till I start talking about cassette tapes. Ooh. <laughs> Go right back. Um but it is like speaking of like Latin America and like Latin and stuff. But the reason why I bring it up is because the essence of everything was the second track on the album. And I remember that it's the second track on the album because it used to call it the essay. And it's just always, it's just always stuck with me. And I'm like, they're so complete opposite, you know, like you've got symphonic metal, but just seeing the word essay, I'm like, all I can think of is Latin music. And, uh, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, a stupid connection my brain has made. Um, but, uh, talking of, you know, you know, Latin music and something a little less, let's say mainstream for lack of a better term. Have you got like music that you find, uh, isn't appreciated, you know, that you've grown up loving or heard? Cause let's be real. That's, we already know the answer is yes. Um, but have you got like artists and things like that that is like, man, I wish they had more exposure for what you know they've created? <laughs> Makes me an otaku, but anime opening <laughs> people who sing the openings Nerd. and closing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I um, can't talk. Um, <laughs> what's her name? Uh, Utada Hikaru. Oh my gosh, yeah, me and France have had many a uh, discussion. 
gushing over how good she is. <laughs> I would, uh, I mean, people, it's funny, you talk music, and music is a thing that brings people together. People, most of the time, can overlook language when there's rhythm or melody mm. or something like that, but uh, my American friends, not always so much uh, mm. when you're like, oh, I'm listening to, you know, a song from here. And they're like, is it in English? I can't listen to it if it's not in English. <laughs> and I'm like, my poor sweet friend, you know, give it a chance. <laughs> I just go to them. Hey, you ever heard of Ramstein? Like, <laughs> if you can like it's, do I mean, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same people that are like, well, I can't understand what he's saying because he's speaking so quickly in a rap song. So I don't like that song or something like that. It's yeah. like. Give things a chance, listen to the song, and you mm. can connect to the song, whether you can hear or understand the words, you can understand the intent and the feeling mm. and the music. Uh, like the, per the only person I let give that excuse is my mom, because she's like, oh, I can't stand that death metal, the whole shit. I'm like, yeah, look, I get it. It's not for you. <laughs> she's like, it's so angry and aggressive. I'm like, they're singing about being the best version of yourself. Like, you'd be surprised how wholesome a lot of these songs actually are. <laughs> like, it can be funny too. That uh, I had a um, a coworker who sang death metal, mm. and she introduced me to a bunch of bands. And I think it was called um, "I Married a Bear Once" or "I Did Something to a Bear Once." Was the name of the band? I wrestled a bear once. That's what it was. Yeah. I wrestled a bear once, and they have a song called "It Smells Like Kevin Bacon." <laughs> Hilarious. Oh, and it's death metal. <laughs> but you gotta give things a shot. That you know, you don't know what you're gonna find. Oh, speaking of funny band names, uh, there's a band in Australia. They're unfortunately not together anymore. Just as a little tangent, they're called the Beards. And every member, so you know how like ZZ Top, you know, are legendary for like their massive beards. Mm. This band's entire identity is just around being a man with a beard. And they even say women should have beards. Everyone should have beards. It's just, it's stupid fun. Um, and they have, like, literally every single song is about beards, except one song. They never mention it until right at the end, the last thing they say is beards. And it's just the funniest <laughs> shit. Um, it, like, I love dumb shit like that in music. Like, where, you know, you don't take it seriously. Have a bit of fun. Because, like, you know... Yeah, music can be very serious, very emotional, outpouring, like, thing that like any art form is. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like anything, you've got to be able to have fun with it and, you know, enjoy it for what it is. Um, now, one last uh, topic that I kind of want to get into, which I do talk about uh, pretty much with everyone as well, uh, is kind of inclusivity, because you run a very wholesome community. Um, and you know, we've got people of all different walks of life in that community. Again, part of the reason why I wanted to do this series is a, to learn people's backstories, connect with people and, you know, open my eyes a little bit to some of the, you know, things people have to go through and stuff like that. Um, how do you find your community is, you know, in terms of welcoming and things like that? Um, um, most of the time we, you know. If you don't come in causing trouble, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to find trouble. I can't guarantee that from Snap. <laughs> yeah, no, he's always looking for a fight. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, uh, perfectly welcoming, ready to talk about games, music, art, anything, mm. you know, um, just a bunch of good people, like I said, looking to do good. Mm. Awesome. Um, now, this isn't the longest one by any means. Um, because, you know, there's only so much to, uh, talk about, but I do want to do a follow-up at some point, um, as well. However, you know, you, you haven't been overly active of late in the online space. Um, now Snap did... Mostly due to internet. Yeah. Due to the fact you have the most unstable connection known to man. The fact it hasn't crapped out on us, uh, is actually surprising to me. Um... <laughs> But Snap did say you have been trying to work on some little projects, uh, which he said he might get in trouble for not sharing that. Uh, but <laughs> uh, what have you got in the works? Like, what's what kind of stuff are you looking to kind of do? Even like, you know, if it's like, okay, well, my internet's shit, maybe I, you know, do I start going to YouTube a little bit more or TikTok or, you know, those sort of things? 
it's a little bit of a se- separate thing than anything I've done before. More of a um, um, beauty, clothing, mm. you know, interest type stuff. Um, not completely prepared uh, for it to be in the works yet, but it's going to mainly headline YouTube and Instagram. Mm. Photographs and videos, um, all, all to do with fashion, clothing, beauty, mm. that type of stuff. Stuff that I uh, (laughs) clearly need to take inspiration from. (laughs) Because I'm still wearing the same shirt that I was wearing when I interviewed, uh, which is my Animal Crossing one. (laughs) I don't know. We could could make a trailer, get a fan to blow your hair. Yeah, well, I have have it all untied. (laughs) uh, I I rarely have it untied just because it gets caught on everything with how freaking long it is. Um, Maybe it's Maybelline. (laughs) You could say. Yeah. Uh, I went to, that just reminds me, I went to the barber the other day. And by the other day, I mean like three weeks ago, because I was like, oh, I need to get this shit show cleaned up, um, which I need to do again. Um, but the barber just sat there because he's like, he recently moved from Italy because um, he's working there with like his uncle or something. I forget the exact story he was telling me. Um, and he just sat there playing with my hair. He's like, it's so long. I'm like, I know. <laughs> he's like, are you ever going to cut it? I'm like, mm, I probably should. He's like, don't. <laughs> I get, like, that's the one thing I get all the time from people. It's either cut your hair, you fucking hippie, or, dude, <laughs> if you cut your hair, I will be sad. We can we can learn together through through my adventures. I, mm. I have been known to wear nothing but black. I don't tend to wear makeup unless it's, like, eyeliner, black eyeliner. Uh, I don't know if this is from my days in... The emo uh, world. Amy Lee, <laughs> <laughs> you know, paint on my hat. I'm usually wearing a cap, you know. Um, so this is a whole new venture for me in mm. colors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, makeup, I, colors, fashion. Ooh, we'll yeah. see. Um, I, I definitely, uh, I, I agree. It's a very unique experience to be like okay let me try changing my fashion sense a little bit uh i tried it and it didn't last very long i went back to tracksuit pants and like just clothes look fit uh because it's like yeah don't get me wrong i don't mind you know putting on a nice pair of jeans and a nice button over shirt and things like that every now and then but you know i'm like i stay at home with my cat now so i'm like i don't care enough uh once covid happened i'm like sweet (laughs) you know back to the comfort zone fuck the rest um, I, I, it's funny that we, we we get that way. Like, it just mm. it's comfortable. I want to wear it. Yeah. The only time I will get out of the comfort zone is if it's cosplay, because mm. I just enjoy cosplay. I mm. enjoy the heck out of just, and that probably is, is more of that you get to be someone that you're not. Yeah. So it's not me in that. So yeah. it's fine. <laughs> you get to build that confidence, and that goes to actually uh, something I was talking about with um, Outlaw Man. You know, because both of us, you know, bigger guys, you know, we're not exactly a traditional form of attractive, let's be honest. Uh, Me and him will gladly both admit that. Um, But, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, having a good supporting community around you helps boost you up, make you feel a lot more confident. And, you know, I've I've maintained, and I said, you know, even just before we started, you're one of the most soft-spoken people I know. Um... And, you know, that can be attributed to a million different reasons and things like that, you know. Um, But compare it to when we first, you know, met, uh, you know, and you were on stream and things like that. You are 10 times louder than you used to be, you know. But even now, you're still very, very quiet. Um, Do you find, you know, as you say, like cosplay obviously helps a lot, but do you find having that community behind you has helped you kind of learn to raise your voice, you know, speak your mind a little bit and be more true to yourself? Of course, of course. Um, I'm that that type of person, I think, that is completely introverted. I don't want to do something. I don't want to talk to someone Mm. until they are my friend. Mm. Once you have crossed that threshold and I know you and I'm comfortable with you, you have to be like, please be quiet. Stop talking. Mm. <laughs> you will not shut up. You have been talking about Naruto for the last hour. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't take it anymore. Be quiet. Um, I, I, I think it's it when you have people you are comfortable with, it helps you come out of your shell a little bit because mm. you're not scared of uh, aggression or being made fun of or any of the 
things mm. that come along with a new person. Mm. Um, do you find uh, that, and I, I can't speak for everyone, but, you know, I feel it's a very general statement to make that we all kind of, you know, at least in our early days of streaming or just content creation in general, uh, kind of put up almost a bit of a facade of, you know, dialing up our personality a lot more than we should to try and feel that we have to fit a specific persona because of, you know, we look at these big creators and we're like, okay, well, we have to be like them. Um, do you find that, hey, I've done that or, you know, I feel like I still kind of do it in some aspects, whether I mean to or not? Or do you feel like, okay, I'm at a point now because I've been doing it for a few years. Although, yes, you know, no, I, you'd say probably peak comfortableness was during Twitch Sing days. Uh, you know, but even now it's like, okay, do you feel that, you know, I am a hundred percent me or do I feel that I have to put on a little bit just to kind of create a bit of separation? I think Twitch things, uh, was peak comfort level mm. only because it didn't feel like I am creating content. Yeah. It felt like because they had the system of parties and most of the people who were in the chat were also people that were singing with you and doing things with you. It was unique. Mm. Um, it wasn't like people coming to just sit there and watch you do something. Mm. Anytime it's just me having to press that go live button and people sit there and have to watch me the first five, ten minutes or whatever, I have to get in that like, hi guys, how you yeah. doing, <laughs> you know? And eventually, once you know, oh, I I remember these are the people that I know, like Francie and Snap and Glenn and you and you know, okay, I can I can sit back a little bit and be a little bit more comfortable, mm. um, and be myself again. But I think everybody goes through that where you know you you press that button and suddenly you have to be like, oh, people are watching me. Um, mm. <laughs> I have to sit up straighter or something. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the most I do is like, oh, maybe I should probably sit up in my chair. If anyone ever pays attention through any of my interviews, you'll see I slowly sink constantly. Um, and will always eventually... You a lot of air. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, like, normally, like, if I sit up straight, because I am a tall guy, I'm here. But I always end up all the way down here. Uh, because I'm like, I, I start sliding in my chair, you know, because I'm like, okay, let me like reach under the microphone to pat my cat who's asleep on my desk at the moment, who is like mad at me because I moved and made noise. How dare I? Um, surprised she hasn't uh, decided to make an appearance. She's actually stayed quiet and not knocked things over for the first time. Meanwhile, it's me who's been making noise. Um, but, you know, I, th I think that's something, you know, a lot of us have. Now she's standing in front of the screen. Okay. You call? <laughs> She's trying to get comfortable, but like the problem is she keeps pulling like just shit from everywhere and dumping it on the desk. So she'll like find napkins and toys and bring it up and sit it on the desk and then she sleeps on top of it and then I'm like Well now I have no room for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. It's a it's a, a lab mm. and it's in the next room and she snores. <laughs> and sometimes, and this I swear it is the loudest sound. And sometimes it pick the mic will pick it up. And it'll just, <laughs> what is that sound? Oh, that's my dog snoring. <laughs> Basically, the most you get from my cat in terms of sound is her just knocking everything over because she is such a klutz. Uh, love her to death, even though she does drive me a little bonkers sometimes, don't you? Um, anyway, because I don't talk about my cat enough. She's about the only thing I give a shit about in the world. Um, so I think that can pretty much wrap us up. But before we do go, have you, uh, can you just let, sorry, can you just let everyone know where they can find you? Um, you know, like YouTubes, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, Twitch, original snow underscore Z. YouTube, I believe is still the original snow, which was my first name. Twitter, all my names are different. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter, I think I am Snow Fairy Gamer. Um, because my original name online was Snow Fairy, but mm. Twitch, it was taken. So, original Snow, that's how you get that. And then SoundCloud, I think I am the original Snow underscore Z. So, it's <laughs> <laughs> a fusion of all of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll, I'll have links to everything down below. Um, do you have anyone you wanted to shout out or anything like that before we wrap up? Obviously, all those who came before me, I am friends with um, a majority of them. 
uh, Glint, Snap, France. I think they were in that order. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did them, and I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I know you had someone else. I've was had uh, E Goblin at the start, um, who is part of my kind of, you know, the way I'd put it main friend group on twitch because like although yes i talk to you like you glint and all that quite a bit when you guys are streaming because the time zones it's really hard whereas like e-goblin pixel sean you know snaps i would kind of consider in that main friend group of mine where it's like okay these are the guys i can talk to really easily because time zones are not as big a problem even though like e-goblin's technically in america but his he works overnights most of the time. So he's usually up while I'm awake. So it's really easy for us to communicate. Um, and yeah, so there's him. Then there's outlaw man, um, who is kind of through like two or three degrees separation from Glint. Cause like, um, who did I get from Glint? I had, I think it was snap and then justify karma. And then I got the Gresham then i got to outlaw men or something like that um like i can't remember the exact order on who i found from who sort of thing i know it basically all started i found glint and then you know from there i just kind of ran into everyone else and you know got yeah. to meet a bunch of amazing people and things like that um but make yeah. sure you like this video and subscribe as well yeah. i'll follow uh, you everywhere and you know uh before we go can you shout out the charities that you're supporting one more time okay saint jude children's hospital of memphis and the um black and missing foundation and also children's music fund there we go beautiful all right thank you so much for watching everyone stay safe out there and uh don't be shit people <laughs>